You know, what he just said goes right along with what I'm going to say. And um, I love the way God is. And I was telling Pastor John in the office before we came out, and I said, this is definitely not a Mother's Day message. And I said, I even tried all day yesterday to try to figure out how to make what God wants me to preach into some kind of Mother's Day message. And it just isn't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. It's just too far out here from Mother's Day. But my first scripture, the Lord just told me, will actually have something to do with Mother's Day. So I'm going to do a few things before I get started. I only brought a few books, and they're out there on the sound system. I think there's three or four of each book or whatever. But these two books just got finished. And I'm in awe that right now I'm working on a three books all at the same time. Anyway, two are done, and one's ready to be whatever, done, so in the next few months. But I'm in amaze that God could take somebody that couldn't read, totally illiterate, that could never stand up in front of people. In school, I would actually run away from school. Cut. If the teacher told me to come into the front of the classroom, instead of coming to the front, I would just walk out the side door and disappear from school. Yeah, because I was so afraid of people standing in front of people and being humiliated because I couldn't read. Well, God's awesome, so book number 10 is just now finished. And uh, so this one's for you. This one's for you. By his stripes you are healed. <laughs> and this one's for you. This is um, Faith Builders, because we all need to have faith built. And, they're back. and then there's another book that's fairly new, and it's uh, When the Supernatural Becomes Natural, and that's back there on the book table. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, almighty God, for everything that you have in store for us this day. And we give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. And Lord, you do what you want to do. Holy Spirit, take over Joan Pierce. God, you receive all the glory and all the honor. And Jesus, you are our very most invited guest. And the Lord just told me that today, some of you are going to be touched in a way that you've never been touched before. I just heard the Holy Spirit say that. He says, because of what you're going through, I'm putting a special anointing on you. So you're going to get a special anointing today. And I'm going to, to have you turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Very important. The Bible says in, let me read part of the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 12. And Pastor... Pastor Mike was wonderful yesterday. He asked me if I didn't want to preach today that I didn't have to. And I thank you for offering that to me, but I need to preach because otherwise you wouldn't know this message. That's not a Mother's Day message. So, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I've taught for years that no matter what you go through, I mean, it's from day one, and you've heard it, many of you here that know me, I say you put your hand to the plow, and no matter what you go through, you never, you never give up. You never go into reverse. No matter what the devil throws at you, you just tell the devil you're a creep and you go forward. That's all there is to it. So it says right here in chapter 12 of Hebrews, it says, therefore, seeing we also are compressed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us. And, and uh, let us turn with patience in the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. For for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising not the shame, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility um, of, for sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. So there's that scripture that says, don't be weary in well-doing. Do you all know what I'm saying? Now, I'm going to do something. Uh, 
I'm going to do it. God told me to do this, so I'm going to do it. All right. My sister passed away, and I'm on my way to the funeral. But on my way to my sister's funeral, I'm here. So, but I want to talk to you about what Pastor John said, which I wasn't going to, but my sister and I, I flew from Florida, and I called my sister, Donna, which we are the closest of all the family. Me and my sister are the very closest, best friend. We're just close. And she not only is close, but she runs the whole ministry. So she runs the whole ministry. So I've been going around trying to figure out what I'm going to do, which I don't know what I'm going to do. And now all I pray to God is, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I don't have the answers, but I'm going. And so that's where I'm at right now. And I told you that yesterday. I'm at a point in my life, and then this just was the topping. But I want to say to whoever that person is, or maybe many of you, so I flew in from Florida, came over and picked up my sister, and we were going because in my heart, and I've just got to share this, in my heart, Marty has been picking up, Marty has gotten very, very close to God, and he keeps picking up that I need to get my family saved. So even though a lot of my family's not saved, We've been sending books and sending tapes and sending praise tapes, and they've been calling me back and chewing me out, some of them. And uh, so, you know, we're about ready to stop sending things, but God won't let us. So then God told me when I came uh, to preach in January, I want you to go on a trip with your two sisters because you need to talk to your sisters so they both, that you know that they're both saved. <clears throat> so then I called my sister and I said, I want you to go with me to Reno, which we just did last weekend, um, because my aunt, my aunt's sick and my, my cousins are sick and I haven't seen them for a long time. And the Lord said, <clears throat> you need to make sure every family member that you have that's still alive, hears the gospel and you need to be persistent about it because time is very late. Are you hearing me? Are you all hearing what the Lord is saying? He's not just saying that for Joan Pierce. He's saying you need to be diligent about going out of your way, visiting people you haven't seen in a long time, and somehow during the visit, whether it's two days or three days or whatever, somewhere in, during that visit you need to share the gospel with people, right? Because their blood will be on your hands if you don't. Because if you, these are people that nobody else is going to go witness to them. Nobody else is going to be honest and truthful. So... I told my sister Donna that we're going to go up and see my aunt and my uncle and my cousins. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead them to the Lord and pray for my cousin that's got cancer, thir third, third level cancer. Anyway, so on the way driving to Reno, my sister, which is not, you know, doesn't know the word. Or it doesn't know the word. So my sister that doesn't know the word says to me, I'm, I'm just so bummed out, and she says, and everything's going wrong. I'm getting evicted out, and this is going wrong, and anyway, I don't need to go in. But she was just negative, 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 negative on all of this that's coming against her. But because she was under so much stress, I just thought while I'm driving the three hours to Reno that I'd just let her get it out. And then she says to me, I'm going to say something to you, Joan, and you are not going to be happy to hear what I'm saying. And I said, well, because she's my bookkeeper and everything, I thought maybe she messed up the books, and didn't send some pastor a packet or forgot something or messed up the bank account. I didn't know what. And I said, Donna, so go ahead and tell me. She goes, no, you're not going to like it because I know how you are. Well, well, she knows how I am because when the, you know, people are around you, they kind of get to know you. And she said, I know you don't like negative stuff and all this stuff, so... She says, I said, well, tell me for crying out loud. Now you've told me this. Now at least tell me. Now, you know, don't just tell me I'm going to be mad four or five times, and I don't know if I should tell you, so tell me. And she says, I don't want to live here anymore. I said, what do you mean? You don't like California? You're going to move back to Florida? No, I don't want to be on planet Earth anymore. She said that at noon, and she died at 3. Your words and your curses... They come out of your mouth. But remember, I said I was going there to make sure everybody's saved. At 4 o'clock that afternoon, my sister, my aunts and uncles, and my cousins 
asked Jesus Christ into their heart at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and she died at 4 in the morning. So maybe she could have lived a lot longer because she was young, okay? But she said she didn't want to be here. She confessed it with her mouth. So don't let the devil... I don't believe my sister was supposed to go yet. But she desired to go, and she confessed it, and she spoke it with her mouth. All right? So it says right here, Lord Jesus, give me strength. It says right here we have a cloud of witnesses, right? And though, though she prayed and asked Jesus in her heart at 4 o'clock and died at 4 in the morning or 3 in the morning, she is now part of that cloud of witnesses. How many of you have a mother that's gone? How many raise your hands? How many of you have a sister that's gone? And somebody that's up there as that cloud of witnesses. So I'm going to say this. Donna, I'm so glad you prayed at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and asked Jesus into your heart, and you accepted the right Jesus, and I thank you. So we have a cloud of witnesses. So everybody just close your eyes and say, Mom, sisters, or whoever's up there that's already ahead of you, Happy Mother's Day. Enjoy your vacation in heaven for eternity. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, so then it goes on that we do, so back into my message now, we do have a cloud of witnesses. And God is saying they're cheering us on because they know that time is running out. And you know, because I just said it, and I'm telling you, you know in your spirit that anything crazy could happen, but God is going to have a great revival and he's going to have great signs and wonders. We've seen more miracles, more notable miracles. And the miracles are increasing and people are wanting Jesus and people are talking about Jesus. And big crusades are going. I've been asked to speak in a coliseum, not a coliseum, what do you call it? A what? A arena, a f a f like a football arena. I don't know if it's stadium or arena. Anyway. So I said, God, give me more souls because I, I want more souls. And so God opened the door for me to speak, speak in this arena that sits 6,000 people. And so God's taken me from here to here. But in the midst of it, you have to go through some things. Because it says right here, okay, in, go with me to Hebrews 12, 24. It says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that is better than that of Abel. See that you be, what's that word? R E, what? Refused. Him not. And speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall he that escapes if he turns away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not the earth only, but also the heavens. And what God is saying to you and I, and his word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, can be shaken that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may not be removed and we are speaking of the kingdom of God and he says everything on earth will be shaken and every kingdom of earth countries and governors and whoever they will be shaken that the only thing that you can stand on and stand on with total confidence is the kingdom of God the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ and him crucified and that you are made in the image of God and you are joint heirs with Christ. So you have this confidence no matter what happens on planet earth, you know that God's in charge and you don't need to walk in fear. You know that God will take care of you. The righteous shall never be forsaken. The seed shall never beg for bread. God will take care of you. So you need to put your confidence and your life on the Lord and on his kingdom, and know that it's unshakable. Everything else is going to shake, shake, rattle, and roll. And what is God going to do? He's going to shake you. Why? Even pastor said, sometimes you get rebuked, but it's for your good. So maybe today's a spanking day. 
all right? It's not a Mother's Day message. But what it is, is you better allow God to get stuff out of your life so that you're ready. You better let God get junk out of your life so that it's just not me, 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 me. Life is more than you. God has called each and every one of us to preach this gospel. Now, he might not call you to do tent meetings or be a pastor like Pastor Mike and, and Pastor John and Pastor Karen. But he, every one of us is to be soul winners. And he that winneth souls is wise. And you have your own sphere. I don't know if that word's right. But you have your own group that nobody else is going to reach but you. That's why I made that trip to Reno. And I didn't know my sister was going to die in the middle of the night with me in the next bed. But she's in a far better place. I've had to have Marty call me. And Marty's called me like all day long. Honey, you okay? I go, yes, honey. No. Do I, have, do I have sunglasses on? No, sunglasses on. Okay, I've been wearing my sunglasses for a lot because I've been crying so much that I couldn't get the tears to stop. I'd just be going through the store and tears are just, I mean, I'm not even like, I mean, I have cried a lot. My eyes are all puffy. I've got them all covered with makeup. But anyway, in fact, my, my eyes are starting to cry again too. Anyway, so God tells us that we need to get ready for what God has coming on earth. Turn with me. Turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, verse 6. But he, which we're speaking of God, but he gives grace, more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud and he gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God, whoever that is that Pastor John was talking about, Submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil. You hearing? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he shall draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. I'm not trying to say you're all sinners, but okay, we probably all have messed up. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. So what God is saying, affirm and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So when you're going through something, you humble yourself. You know, I'm going like, God, thank you so much that I got to lead my sister to the Lord a few hours before she died. I thank you, God, that I have the confidence to know that my sister's in heaven, not burning in hell. In fact, just, and we have to get gutsy, because just in January, I took my two sisters on a trip, and I, I mean, it was like, I paid for the whole trip, and I didn't have the money to pay for it. But you know how good God is? My aunt and uncle said, I visited my other aunt and uncle, which they are saved, and they go, why are you doing all this for them? You put them in a fancy hotel with a hot tub, and, and you're spending all this money. And I said, well, I don't really have it, but I just stuck it on the credit card. But why did you do that? Because my aunt and uncle are saved. So I said, well, she says, I said, well, I said, they're both in a cult, and i got to speak the truth to them. And they might not like what I'm going to say, but that's why I've got, them, I've got them captured. I have the car. I rented the car. They can't go nowhere. I'm the only one that can drive the car. I have them captured. I have them captured for three days. And we went all up and down the beach, and my one sister said to me as we're driving back, she goes, Joan, you know, you've been talking an awful lot about this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And I said, yeah. And she, she said to me, I couldn't believe my sister said it. Now I get to see her in two more days at a funeral, my other sister's funeral. And we'll pick up our conversation. Because you see, my sister is Mormon. They're both Mormon. But one's not Mormon no more. Because of that trip. Because I said, wait a minute. And I asked him. And, and Marty, bless his heart. Marty was on the phone with me. Ask him this question. Ask him that question. Ask him this question. And I said, and he asked him this question. So, you know, it was like two or three hours in between these phone calls. So, and we had three days. So it wasn't like I, you know, hit him the whole time. I got one. I got my, I mean, I didn't hit him the whole time. My sister that just passed away, we went down to the hot tub, so I had an hour with just her alone. But what's neat 
is I said, how do you get saved? They told me how you get saved. Who's Lucifer? What's hell? And they told me that Lucifer was the first Jesus. And that he is Jesus. And that he's the brother of Jesus. And, I, and so I confronted him four months ago before my sister got wise. Because everything I said did not return. But when I talked to her four hours before she died or seven hours or whatever it was, she confessed the right Jesus. Because she said, when you talked to us when we were driving around, you told me that I t you said that Satan could not be the brother of Jesus because you explained to us that Jesus was God in the flesh. And I said, that's why the Mormon church is a cult. And I said, and they tried to say that Jesus, Satan was the first Jesus. And I said, let me share scriptures with you. And I shared scriptures until they were so mad at me. They, they were getting mad at me that my sister said, my one sister, my other one that's still alive, says to me as we're driving back, I need to ask you something, Joan. So we've been listening to you for three days. And do you think we're going to hell? And I said, well, if you don't change who Jesus is, you're on your way to hell. That scared my sister enough to study it out and get saved. Now I'm praying that my other sister through this death, because even though it's a Mormon funeral, I asked. <laughs> I said, could I um, speak at my sister's funeral? And they said, would you like to do the eulogy? And I said, I would love to. I said, how long will I have? I said, do I have at least 10 minutes? Because 10 minutes is long enough for me to tell all those Mormons how to get saved. Oh, you don't think I'll do that? Once I do it, they can kick me out, you know. But I doubt if they're going to kick me out. They won't be happy. But they are going to hear the truth. Yeah, they're going to hear the truth. And so maybe my sister's going to be, my other sister that's still alive is going to be really ticked off at me. She's probably telling the bishop already, don't let her, don't let her get up there. But I've already got permission. Ten minutes, they said, if you need a little longer. I said, I might. <laughs> Why? Because we're so close to the end, people. We're going to have a great revival, but how long will it take to have a great revival? A nuclear bomb. Now, I don't believe we're going to get nuked. Not yet. We might, I don't even think we'll be here. But what I'm saying, it just takes a little disaster to have people... Believe me, I've been at 911. A little bit of a disaster. People get scared. And the, all those people that heard the gospel and everywhere you planted the seed and everywhere you gave out tracts, all of a sudden, all those seeds that you put out there for all the years are going to spring up because they're going to remember what you said. And all of a sudden, they'll drop on their knees. You might not even be there, but you let some catastrophe happen and they'll all remember what you said. They will remember something they saw on TV, remember what you said, read a tract you gave them, a book you gave them or something, and they'll drop on their knees in one second. Thousands and millions of people will give their heart to Jesus. Because God is going to have a great revival that's going to sweep all through America, around the world, because he's shaking us. So right now, what God is saying to each and every one of us, let God discipline you, shake you, ratify you, do whatever he has to do to get you on your face before him. Turn with me in your Bibles now to Peter. Peter. In verse... Chapter 1, verse 7. That the trying of your faith. Oh my God, you mean your faith can be tried? Being much more precious. Look how precious it is when you're tried. I was being tried by both of my sisters when they were confronting me and thinking they were going to hell and all this stuff. But you've got to speak the truth. Sometimes your family doesn't want to hear the truth. They don't even want to be around you. I mean, so don't try to shove it down their throat. I mean, in three, three days, I, you know, I had to do a quick work. <laughs> but it wasn't like every minute, like while we were eating dinner on the wharf, we didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I took a little breather now and then for a half hour, an hour. <laughs> no. no, actually, you know, but you can say a lot. Just watch what you say. And when you say it, make sure it's straight on. And it's the Holy Ghost and Marty. Because Marty was constantly... 
did you ask him this? Did you ask him that? Because he's out there praying, and he's praying for me. He goes, how did it happen? What happened? What happened? And he is so happy that my sister he says, you know what? He said, isn't it amazing that since January, we have had an urgency in our spirit to talk to every family member. An urgency. Because you never know. One day they're here, and one day they're not. It's just that fast. So, it says, so, that the trying of our faith, much more precious than gold, that perishes through it, though it's tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearance of Christ Jesus. So God is saying, when you go through a little affliction and you go through a little fire because of what you're saying and you're witnessing to people and maybe people don't want to hear it, you count it all joy. Because to God, when you're spending time telling people about Jesus, that he says, when you go through these fiery trials, he said, I see you as a piece of gold going through the fiery furnace. And God wants you to know that he loves you so much and he loves your family so much and he loves you because some of you maybe have to get some things out of your life so that you are effective. You see, it's not about you. You know that if you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, you're going to heaven. But you don't want to go to heaven empty-handed. And you can't be any good to God. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean that, that, that harsh. But anyway, you, you have to be willing to let God use you as a vessel. It's not just me going to heaven. It's not just you going to heaven. Are you going to heaven? Are you going to heaven? It's like, how many can you take with you? How many people? They, they could be total strangers. They could be somebody that works for you. Uh, it could be on a mission trip. You, I invite you all to go on a mission trip with me. Want to go on a mission trip? You're allowed to. This is the cheapest mission trip we can ever go. 25 bucks. 20. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. 25 bucks and a plane ticket. You have to buy your own plane ticket. Okay, husband, buy the ticket. No, I'm serious. If some of you wanted, I'm serious. If some of you wanted to go on this trip, which is the cheapest, $25, plus your airfare, and that 25 I don't even, if you don't have the $25, I'll pay the $25. Um, and it's upstate New York with a sightseeing day in the city, which I don't really want to see the city again, but every time I do something in New York, I can go on the, one of the double-decker buses and say, around the corner is the Iron House, and then the, the, this is the Statue of Liberty, and it was established, and blah, 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 you know. So anyway, I could take over the mic and do the tour guide. But anyway, but I figure if people are going to spend their money, they stay an extra day and go see New York. And we're expecting about 2,000 people. We're going to hit the streets. We're in one of the roughest gang-infested infect, areas of Newburgh, New York. And, and we're, we set up our event half on this gang and half on this gang. Okay? Gang wars. Whoop! So the property is like partway on that gang and partway. And we're talking. What's that? 13... U.S. 13 or whatever. We're talking about some pretty violent. So, but we don't walk in fear. And we will have policemen there. <laughs> Only because uh, pastor's a pastor's part of the police force. So he's going to have, so we have, you know, I don't know if we'll have guns. I doubt if we'll have guns. But anyway. Okay, so let me, let me go on. It says here, Peter, 1 Peter 4, 12. 4.12, y'all got it? 1 Peter 4.12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the, f the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed. You may be glad also with exceedingly joy. He, he doesn't say just a happy little joy. He says, if you get persecuted and suffered, and you suffered like Christ had to suffer on the cross and be laughed at and mocked at, and if you, you, you join in in God's suffering for the gospel's sake, 
then the joy and the anointing of God. People ask me, how do you get the anointing? Just go out and tell somebody about Jesus. You talk to somebody else about Jesus. Boom. You talk to somebody else about Jesus. And after you've led about six, seven people to Jesus, you walk past somebody and they fall out under the power of God. Or they drop on their knees and go, oh, what must I do to be saved? And it increases and increases and increases until the whole cities drop on their knees and whole states come to Jesus because God is an awesome God, but it means you have to be willing to suck it up. Stop being wimps. Too many wimpy Christians. It's time for us to be bold and step out and pray for the sick and tell that devil, now I did something wrong. I'm going to tell you what I did wrong because the Holy Spirit just told me what I did wrong. It's too late, so I can't be mad at myself. God said to me, when your sister was driving up there and said all that negative stuff, and when your sister said she didn't want to live here on planet Earth anymore, saying she wanted to die and go to heaven, why didn't you rebuke those words and pray against those words? And I was like, I don't know why, didn't I? And the next thing is, how spiritual can I be? Are you ready? I mean, I'm in tune with the Holy Spirit, right? And I was trying to figure this out. I'm in tune with the Holy Spirit, and my sister is dying in the twin bed beside me. And I thought she was having a nightmare because she was making some funny noise. And I just yelled at her, Donna, you're having a dream. Go to sleep. And she rolled over, and I went back to sleep. How sensitive am I to the Holy Spirit that my sister is dying in the bed beside me? And I get up in the morning and put my robe on and slip out and don't want to wake her up till 9, and she's been dead a long time. And I was like trying to figure this out. The Lord gave me the answer. Because you'd think the Holy Spirit would tell me, and I'd call 911 in the middle of the night, right? Because that's what she wanted. That's what she wanted, and she must have not just been saying it that day. She'd probably been saying it for months, and that's what she wanted. And so the Lord just said, stay asleep. Stay asleep. Because he gave her her request and got me out of the way. So you watch what you say, because when you really mean it in your heart, You'll get it. And he says here, if, in verse 14, so you're supposed to count it over. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you on their part. He is evilly spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And God wants you to know that verse 17 for the time is come that judgment begins at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, what shall be the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And what is the gospel? God's telling us to go preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to the lost, the hurting, and the dying. He wants you and I to preach this gospel to the lost, the dying. And obey God's word. Go with me to 5, 6. 5, 6. Still in Peter. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking who he may devour. Who resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have 
suffered a little while makes you perfect, established, strengthens, and settles you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever.